We mustn't make a sound, said Polly, as they climbed in again behind the cistern. Because it was such an important occasion, they took a candle each. Polly had a good store of these in her cave. This is Pints with Jack, Inkling Candles, with Michelle Hogan. Welcome everyone. Here on Pints with Jack, we're reading our way to the works of C.S. Lewis, and this month we're wrapping up Season 6. Today's quotation comes from The Magician's Nephew, where we hear that Polly had a good supply of candles. Because today I'm speaking with someone else who also has quite a candle collection, Michelle Hogan, owner and creator of Inkling Candles. As listeners will know, we took my daughter to be baptised in Minneapolis after she was born, as there's a Byzantine Catholic parish there, St John the Baptist, and we attend it periodically, about once a quarter typically. And we did the same with my son, uh, because my wife and I both love the Byzantine Rite, and also in the Byzantine Rite, kids receive all of their sacraments of initiation at once. They're baptised, chrismated, confirmed, and they receive their first Holy Communion all as babies. Anyway, as we uh, stayed overnight the night before, we stayed with some friends of mine, Aaron and Beth, and Aaron presented us when we arrived with one of Michelle's candles. So when we got home, I messaged Michelle, and well, here we are. Michelle Hogan, welcome to Pints with Jack. Hi David, thank you so much for having me on today. You're very welcome, how's it going? Um, good, I'm very excited to be here. Um, it's kind of funny because I actually knew of your quote before you were going to say it. And I really wanted to understand uh, Polly because I got very excited. <laughs> it was kind of fun <laughs> having like a tie. I hadn't read the Chronicles yet. So um, I plan to do that this winter. I've been re re busy reading adult books, as Jack would call them. Um, so hadn't gotten to it. But I had ordered it and I thought it came in the wrong order because The Magician's Nephew was the first book in the set. And I was super confused. Mm -hmm. And like I knew enough to know <laughs> The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe was the first book. Like I knew that. So um, I thought mm -hmm. that Amazon printed it wrong. And I went on their website and then I figured out that it was supposed to be printed that way. Um, but I have to say that I really loved it being presented in that way. I had tried to like do the cliff notes and watch the movie last month. And I got like 30 minutes into it mm -hmm. thinking this makes no sense. These kids show up to some house. You don't know what's going on. There's a piece of furniture and then there's like a lamp post in the middle of this like snowy forest. And so, um, it all made sense. I quit watching it because I was like, I just don't know if I can buy what he's selling. So, um, but after I read <laughs> The Magician's Nephew, I was like, I could totally go into the, like, The Lion, the Witch now because the wardrobe is no longer just a piece of furniture. You know, the history behind the wardrobe and, like, the special significance of the wood that is in it. It's like a vessel, not just a piece of furniture and then the lamp post made sense it just felt so abrupt <laughs> in the beginning of the lie in the witch and world like you were thrown in um to this book so mm -hmm. i appreciated reading that first and now i'm actually excited to read the lie in the witch in the wardrobe and of course being like polly then i'm kind of like the first girl or at least lucy's twin so that was really fun too <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so you're a fan of the chronological order. It's a very hotly contested debate in the, in the Lewis world. I am. But uh, I'll, I'll put you down for that column. I loved it. <laughs> so today we're going to talk a little bit about your background, your candle company, and your interest in the Inklings. But we should first begin with a toast. And today I'm enjoying Road Slush from New Glarus. Uh, I figured since I was speaking to someone from my neighboring state, I should represent mine. Uh, are you drinking anything? <laughs> I am. You're going to be so disappointed with my answer. It's Diet Coke. <laughs> That's fine. That's fine. If, it's if so you like, unrefined. If you, like the you go for it's it. It's so unrefined. <laughs> I know. It's terrible. Ooh. Well, with your Diet Coke and my local beer, we're going to toast Kevin Larson. Uh, Kevin, may your wick always be trimmed and may your candle burn clean and bright. Cheers. Cheers. So to begin with, would you mind just telling us a little bit more 
about yourself and how you came to start a candle company inspired by the works of the Inklings. I can. Um, so my husband and I recently moved to the Twin Cities. We were in the North Shore of Two Harbors, um, Minnesota. I, I have that Minnesota accent. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> It's and okay. so I'll translate if necessary. <laughs> it's so bad. So we had a gift shop there and then I developed the candle line um, in the fall of 2021 and I sold it in the gift shop last year. But when we moved down here, I didn't have the brick and mortar anymore. So I've been trying to, to sell them um, in art shows and church festivals, like where your friend had found the candle, um, in the hopes that I can build up a clientele over time. It's been a little uh, tricky trying to sell such a tailored candle line. <laughs> um, not everyone quite understands the concept. <laughs> so, so, but the ones who do are really fun. So thank you so much for asking me. Um, on today, my faith has constantly wavered, uh, even up until the day before your email. So, <clears throat> so yeah, this is perfect. Um, and the role of the inklings and the candles both tied into uh, my Catholicism conversion that started um, in the fall of 21. And just a little like brief bio of uh, kind of why that was significant and kind of how it correlates to the material that I found later on. Um, I had suffered what I call a spiritual and mental death in 1992 at the age of 13 when I was in seventh grade. And it was so bad, it severed my relationship with God for 28 years up until that fall of 21. And, um, I had been in a hallway and I was hit in the face by a peer and um, <clears throat> all of the kids were chanting, I would finally gotten what I deserved. I had, um, it's a long story, but um, I had been harassed by some guys and my youth pastor had reported it and it just turned into this horrible thing. And then like Jack, that wasn't my only bad experience in school. Um, in sixth grade, I dealt with a lot of girl click issues uh, where I was in a click and then I was out of the click and they not only didn't let me back in the click, um, they like literally turned the entire class against me. So um, basically those two instances were like already like an end to a tragic upbringing. And I had been a faithful lover of Jesus uh, up until that moment, I didn't have a father growing up. And so Jesus was, was my father. I never had a male role model and I was raised Christian missionary Alliance. And I'm really taught about empathy from my mother and, um, care for people. And, uh, and it just, I really, I just was really a faithful lover. I was baptized at nine by full immersion. And so as I saw these things happening and as these things happened to me, um, I just didn't understand kind of why God or Jesus wasn't there and all these, when I had been so faithful and I wasn't protected as a child and didn't have anyone to protect me. And so <clears throat> that was kind of that. So fast forward to 28 years. <laughs> In the spring of 21, um, when a fellow artist in town I knew through the gift shop had contacted me. And through her discussions, I realized that God had sent her to work out some of these past issues that I had. And we spoke daily. And one evening, we got together in person to meet. And um, it was such a remarkable discussion. And I was so impressed by her character and the time and love she had put into me um, and kind of my salvation. And she was Catholic. And I didn't, I'd never known a Catholic. I was never really wanting to know a Catholic. Um, I was 
kind of the stereotypical like y'all are weird and this isn't for me um you're not wrong we are weird you know yes i'm very weird now and so (laughs) but i love it i'm so happy and so um i remember like asking her questions about catholicism just like why mary you know just questions and um i found myself when i was getting into the car telling God that if I ever came back to him, I would be Catholic too. Um, Kind of like a word, I guess, or a vow. And so a couple months later, that was in June. In August, that happened. And so um, I was very allegiant to God and went immediately to the Catholic Church that she had gone to to sign up for RCIA classes, they were called. They've changed it now, I think, to OCIA or something. Um, But meanwhile, a customer in my gift shop had told me about this website called blessedisshe.com. I was a new Catholic, and she was an old Catholic, but she she left the church, but her mother was still very faithful. And so she was really excited to help me on my Catholicism journey, even though she had left. Because she still enjoyed the religion, but um, hers, unfortunately, went to a sexual incident in the church as well. And so she left those graces because, um, you know, she's just trying to work that out. Um, But she was very lovely and told me about this website, and um, I love to shop. So I went to their shopping page, and they have candles. And um, it was kind of weird because I didn't burn candles smells make me nauseous and so i debated this frankincense candle but i had remembered that my new catholic friend had told me that you burn incense in mass um to help elevate your senses and so i thought well i want to try this (laughs) um like at home i'm doing devotions and um this would be fun so finally i did and then the spiritual idea for the candles came because in RCAA, I was um, learning a lot again. I hadn't been Christian as an adult, and I wasn't really familiar with the Bible. And I had like a Precious Moments one when I was little, but like those stories aren't the same as the real words. And so I was just enjoying everything I was learning. It was like this whole new relationship with God, but as an adult, and I felt like I was really understanding kind of like how to view God in a way that I hadn't viewed him before and the way that relationship meant. And as I was burning the candle, I just thought like, wouldn't it be fun to have candles that were faith-based, but with stories on the back that tell you about the candle and kind of, I don't know how it all correlated, I guess. Um, But I tabled that because I just didn't have an interest in learning how to make candles. So the idea just kind of kept bothering me um, to the point that I had even reached out to a couple candle makers I knew, being I owned a shop, but neither of them were real jazzed about helping with a Christian candlelight. (laughs) So, so again, I tabled it. And, um, then one day my, I just, I don't know why I felt like this prompting to pick up my husband's copy of surprised by joy. And I didn't know what the book was. And the only thing I knew about CS Lewis is he sounded very boring. (laughs) I just was not, I don't know. The most I read was like People Magazine. (laughs) Like this was a very strange thing for me to do. But I picked it up and I started reading it. And when I got to the biscuit tin story, (laughs) um, something happened. (laughs) Um, And reflecting on it, I thought I could probably count on one hand the moment the many moments of true joy that I felt as a child. And, <clears throat> sorry, being out in nature by myself, which I was most of the time in my imagination, was um just really beautiful. 
and it was they were some of the happiest moments I had and so I just think hearing him describe this tin forest just kind of brought back all those emotions that I felt and it was like oh that's what joy felt like and so I wanted to know more about him <laughs> so I put down the book and I went to Wikipedia <laughs> and um learned about him and learned about the Inklings and then learned about Owen and um I'd gotten to the quote uh I'd gotten to the quote where Owen had referenced his relationship with Jack um, after Jack had passed, I think it was in a speech, and he had given this, like, beautiful, romantic um, kind of tribute to him. And I just thought it was so beautiful, and relationships had always seemed so foreign to me. And hearing Owen talk just kind of... Um, expressed to me the true attachment that someone could feel for another person. And I was just very moved by the whole experience. And then I just kind of felt like even though I didn't know who any of them were or anything they wrote, I could tell that the influence they'd had on people was enough that they should stay present. 1919 was a century ago, and that's when um, Owen and Jack met. And so to kind of honor that relationship, I just wanted to do the candle with that quote. And um, it just kind of blossomed into this thing and so after telling god no a couple more times i knew i'd have to learn to make them myself um so i did and my knowledge basically ceased of the inklings at that point i never read any of their books and um i just acted like Please don't let me ask them any questions about the material when the people come up to me excited about the Lord of the Rings. And I'm like, I have no idea who these characters are. <laughs> so it's interesting because people think that you must have knowledge being you're this passionate. And I had none. It was truly just a calling. And so it's been frustrating these past two years not understanding why I'm doing this just knowing that I'm supposed to be doing it. But after you contacted me, I knew you were gonna ask me why I liked the Inklings and I was afraid I'd look dumb <laughs> because I had no answer. So I have spent the last two months, my husband could tell you, morning to night devoted to figuring out why. Um, and that's why I asked for an hour instead of a half hour because I have so much to share now. <laughs> so that's pretty much it until we got to the candles. That's quite an incredible story. And I'm going to tell you something truly awful. Surprised by Joy was the first of Lewis's books I read as an adult. I grew up on Narnia, loved it. And I then discovered that, oh, he wrote other things. And I picked up a copy of Surprised by Joy. I got a little bit beyond the garden biscuit tin <laughs> scene and I gave up because in that book Lewis says if you're not interested in this this isn't the book for you and I concluded ah this isn't the book for me mm -hmm. and so it was probably a good 10 years before I actually picked him up again and then saw with new eyes I how, love that uh, how impactful he was that's beautiful <laughs> but that, that's also quite incredible that that you're a moved by that and also the fact that you saw something very special in lewis's relationship with owen barfield because barfield he's got some pretty wild ideas and his uh his uh his books aren't always the easiest to read no uh but he he is someone who i've been getting increasingly interested in particularly as i've been running this podcast we've had an owen barfield month uh 
around the time of this episode, we will have another Owen Barfield episode where I'm interviewing two authors who have just written a book about him. Um, so yeah, so don't know what, let's 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 move on from there. Let's actually now specifically talk about the candles because you kindly enough sent me a set of your candles. So would you mind just talking us through some of them and explain how you go about designing and making them? Sure. Um, so I use, some people ask if you use essential oil, but I actually use formulated candle oils um, for consistency and quality and soy wax, which people are into soy more. And so um, it's not beeswax. <laughs> if someone asked me that for biblical purposes, <laughs> um, so it's not beeswax, <laughs> but it is soy. Continuing with the modern flair of of kind of the candles, introducing um, something new in the world. And so, um, yeah, I've tried, I have a very sensitive nose, so I've tried probably a hundred scents. And the ones that I was left with, with that I have right now are the ones I can tolerate. They're Lots of them I poured. Literally, it's so boring. People are like, oh, these are so great. How did you choose the scents? And it's like literally the ones that don't make me want to throw up. So, um, but people love them. <laughs> and I get a lot of compliments. So I think God did okay with my sense of smell. Um, and there's currently 11 scents in the collection. So, and I was inspired to add a couple more, um, I think next year. So mutual admiration is based on Charles Williams' relationship with Jack. And there's a lot more I plan to learn about Charles Williams, but um, the focus clearly for me became Jack and Owen on this journey. Um, but so much good stuff there and affection with the mutual admiration title. Brotherly love is based on Jack's relationship with his brother, Warney. And um, again, just, I think, so much there, uh, feeling-wise, that probably hasn't been addressed. But the things that I've come across are just so beautiful. And the fact that they live together until they die pretty much just says everything right there. Um, Among the Trees is based on their realm, Lothlorien don't know what the realm is but um when i was reading the <laughs> c.s lewis's letters to children i always got really excited when i found a sentence in there that um jack had used to describe it and he had said particularly the heartbreaking quality in the most beautiful places like lothorian and that was exciting for me because then i knew that jack would have approved um and then Circa 1919 is based on Jack and Our Lady for um, the honor of the Blessed Mother, and then Trinity for the love of God, and then the individual characters, Tolkien, <laughs> Tolkien and Lewis, <laughs> um, Gandalf, and then Chesterton, who I know nothing about. He's a newer addition, but the father at St. Clement's said that I had to have a Chesterton candle, so I do what they tell me to do. And <laughs> Quite right. Yeah. Quite right. My wife runs pints with Chesterton, yes. and I agree. <laughs> it's so in the daily devotion. So, yeah, and then each the back of each jar is a story that was written purely on... Um, Google search and, and intuition and imagination because um, I I knew nothing. Writing them was very little knowledge and um, probably not proper punctuation. So they're not <laughs> they're they're probably not maybe a hundred percent accurate. But uh, with what I didn't have uh, to work on, I've think they turned out okay. Um, they're really pretty anyway. And I have little sampler boxes that I re recently created because it's hard to sell something online that you'd smell in person. And so, um, like I do fun, at sh it's fun at shows, I do good, but like trying to get online business, 
Um, first, I don't understand like algorithms, so even someone finding them. Um, but then second, it's just hard uh, trying to sell something in smell. So anyway, the sampler boxes mm -hmm. um, are $15, and then it's a tea light, which isn't a tea light smell. It's not going to permeate a whole space, but it gives you at least a little idea of like what each one smells like and then it's they're fifteen dollars so it's not it's more cost effective way before you invest in commit to a full size candle. So yeah. Mm -hmm. I I would maybe walk you through a little more, which is probably what I should do because I have to sell them. But I'm really excited about what I found out. So <laughs> so people can visit my website. And what is that? It's um inklingcandles.com wonderful and i will say one of the things i like about your candles is that they are not overpowering i i generally stayed away from scented candles because they were usually far too pungent yes. there's a subtlety to your candles which i really like good good and out of the set that you've sent me uh they are going to be at least the ones i don't keep for myself i'm going to be sending them on to some randomly selected top tier supporters so they'll get to sample them as well i love that thank you you're welcome but let's move on and talk about what you've discovered. It, it is quite an incredible story that you, you were struck enough by surprise by joy to invest your time and devotion into the Inklings uh, and then start to find out more about them. So you, before, we were chatting just before the show. You had lots of things you want to talk about. Okay. Yes. Lots of good stuff. Um, and yeah, so it hopefully it's okay if I cite some of the things that sure. were written mm -hmm. for Jack. Okay. Um, so yeah, so uh, when I when I started the research on the Inklings, I'd wanted to understand their hearts and not their minds. That's not my wheelhouse, as my husband would say. Um, so the last grade I completed was eighth because um, after everything that had happened in sixth and seventh grade, I became a runaway and um, don't know where I was running to, just knew I didn't want to be here anymore. And so <clears throat> I didn't finish school, but I did get a GED and did a trade program. <clears throat> and so when I started my research, my sister got a kick out of this. She, I don't know, she thought of a movie, but I... <laughs> I had gathered together resources that, um, one, the Holy Spirit just led me to. I didn't know what I was looking for, what I was reading per se, um, and a dictionary. <laughs> and <laughs> that became very helpful because there's a lot of hard words <laughs> that, that you and even some of your hosts use for people like me. And so I'm going to do something very out of my comfort zone, but in your honor, I have to quote a line from The Magician's Nephew that I read yesterday because I busted out laughing so hard knowing like coming into this interview and how what, like weird this role was for me. So when the cabbie, who was very difficult to understand <laughs> with his broken language, but he goes, Begging your pardon, sir, he said, and thanking you very much, I'm sure. But I ain't no sort of a chap for a job like that. I've never had much education, you see. <laughs> and I just thought that was great because it was like, okay, you don't have to be um, necessarily a scholar or smart to be chosen um, to have an impact or an influence or... To be a king or queen. Um, something on someone. Yeah. So that was encouraging. Um, so the first thing, because I was a broad slate, that popped out to me happened while I was listening to Humphrey Carpenter's bio of the Inklings on Audible while um, I poured candles. And so I was trying, I had so much to read. I was like, okay, well, let me try to listen to something. Mm -hmm. And so the instance revealed why I was called to know Jack um, in the fall of 21. And so <clears throat> Humphrey had said, or he had asked in the chapter um, about the fox, he said, the question at the beginning of this chapter was were the Inklings more than just a group of friends? 
So far, it has only received some rather patchy answers. Are we after the wrong fox? Should we not rather ask what sort of friends were they? And then further down, he says, Jack's attitude to friendship was also affected by his experience at Malvern when he found that the school was ruled by the unofficial clique of bloods. He saw this group as at once highly objectionable and infinitely enviable, and his feelings about it eventually became a fixation. He called such groups inner rings. He wrote when describing the frequency of such things in society. There exist two different system of hierarchies. The one is printed in some little book, and anyone can easily read it out. A general is always superior to a colonel, and a colonel to a captain. The other is not printed anywhere, nor is it evenly a formally organized secret society with officers and rules which you would be told after you had been admitted. You are never formally and explicitly admitted by anyone. You discover gradually, in almost indefinable ways, that it exists and you are outside it, and then later, perhaps, that you are inside it. People think they are in it after they have in fact been pushed out of it, or before they have been allowed in. This provides great amusement for those who are really inside. I believe that in all men's lives, one of the most dominant elements is the desire to be inside the local ring. Humphrey continues, Whether or not this really corresponds to most people's experience of the world, Circumstances conspired to embed the idea in Lewis's mind, for when he came up to Oxford as an undergraduate, he found himself in a society where cliques really did play a large part. I have a holy terror of coteries, he told his father when describing university life, but really the terror was of not belonging to one himself, and he gradually drew his own coterie around him. Men such as Barfield, who shared his taste for traditional art forms as opposed to modernism. Then came his fellowship at Maudlin and his discovery that the college was ruled to a large extent by the unofficial junto of progressives under the leadership of Harry Weldon. This really was an inner ring, and it inevitably increased Lewis's determination to gather his own friends around him for protection. Lewis, to a large extent, turned his back on his college and concentrated on the English faculty. Here, too, he found something of an inner ring, the literature camp, and after at first giving his allegiance to it, Lewis soon broke away and formed his own clique with Tolkien, a clique that actually managed to change the direction of the whole faculty. It was to a large extent this clique, Lewis, Tolkien, Coghill, and others of like mind, who were the nucleus of the Inklings when that group began to meet. And then Humphrey concluded the chapter with this. One day, Tolkien, in a letter to his son Christopher, referred to the Inklings as the Lewis Seance, and there was more than an element of truth in this. They were Lewis's friends. The group gathered round him, and in the end, one does not have to look any further than Lewis to see why it came into being. He himself is the fox. I just thought that was so pretty. <laughs> and it just kind of <clears throat> explained <laughs> why um, he kind of was and does seem to be like a root ground with these men. Mm. <clears throat> so, yeah, it just made sense. And go ahead. I'm sorry. Did you have something to say? Uh, Lewis also has written an essay called The Inner Ring, which I think you would like. And have you read The Four Loves yet? No, but I actually have a quote from the inner ring. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. So um, there's a lot that's lined up with us, including in your notes. So the Holy Spirit is definitely here. So um, <clears throat> I'm like Owen, where I think about thinking and I constantly search for answers. And so um, when I heard this segment, I wanted to find the inner ring. So I did. And some of the passages, because this all leads to my healing, um, his stories. So some of the passages from the inner ring, um, he had said, I am going to do something more old fashioned than you perhaps expected. I am going to give advice 
I am going to issue warnings. Advice and warnings about things which are so perennial that no one calls them current affairs. And it's just a few paragraphs, not the whole thing. I am not going to say that the existence of inner rings is an evil. It is certainly unavoidable. There must be confidential discussions, and it is not only not a bad thing, it is in itself a good thing that personal friendship should grow between those who work together. But the desire which draws us into inner rings is another matter. A thing may be morally neutral, and yet the desire for that thing may be dangerous. Of all the passions, the passion for the inner ring is most skillful in making a man, who is not yet a very bad man, do very bad things. It is the very mark of a perverse desire that it seeks what is not to be had. The desire to be inside the invisible line illustrates this rule. As long as you are governed by that desire, you will never get what you want. You are trying to peel an onion, and if you succeed, there will be nothing left. Until you conquer the fear of being an outsider, an outsider you will remain. And <clears throat> that just really, really struck me. Um, because when my Catholic friend had contacted me that spring, I was struggling with feeling like an outsider in the local business community. <clears throat> I live further away from the other businesses. Um, there's kind of like this whole little generational thing going on. And um, I don't know. And so trying to self-assess myself throughout this journey, um, <clears throat> I realized that I never felt worthy because I was ashamed of my circumstances. And because of that, I never like allowed myself to truly feel like I belonged. And so just that last statement, um, you know, until you conquer the fear of being an outsider, an outsider you will remain, just really like struck me. And then also um, the fact that Jack had dedicated a whole lecture to heed a warning on this topic showed me how truly important it was to him I, through the Holy Spirit, too, had spoken at a school eight years ago um, on the effects and like just kind of like that these things could have on you. So I was really shocked that this man who I thought I had nothing in common with from another country had done the same thing. And so I picked up the book that I had put down two years ago, Surprised by Joy, and um, kept reading because they, they had, I had heard by now that whatever had happened with him, I didn't know what it was yet, um, he discussed and surprised by joy. So, I mean, I was like, I had to find out the answer. <laughs> so I um, picked up the book and then, sorry, I'll just share with you the last, I'm almost done with this topic. Um, but kind of for me, what solidified the whole thing into my aha white jack moment um finally after two years uh and i'm just so grateful you asked me on because i never would have even looked to any of this and would have still kept doing this not understanding unless i wanted to appear smart so, so, <laughs> why do you think i have a podcast so... to try and appear smart <laughs> so Jack said, and I paraphrase things, so I cut like segments from, it's not cohesive, but what struck me was Jack had said, I would not be he. I had become a prig, a highbrow. He said, those who defend the schools will of course say that these prigs are the cases which the system failed to cure. They were not kicked, mocked, fagged, flogged, and humiliated enough. But surely it is equally possible that they are the products of the system, that they were not prigs at all when they came to their schools, but were made prigs by their first year as I was. And I had written, I started school at 12, sane and wholesome, and I did not leave sane and wholesome at 13. I was a product of the system, like he said. He continued for really what would be a very natural result, where oppression does not completely and permanently break the spirit, has it not a natural tendency to produce retaliatory pride and contempt? 
and I had written that we were different in that regard. <laughs> he was a prig and I was a mess. <laughs> but Jack understood the completely broken spirit that could result like mine had, and that meant something to me. And he had continued. And that is why I could not give pederasty, which I looked up and was shocked <laughs> at this comparison. But it, it was profound that he would compare it to those things. Anything like a first place among the evils of the call. <clears throat> there is much hypocrisy on this theme. People commonly talk as if every other evil were more tolerable than this. But why? Because those of us who do not share the vice feel for it a certain nausea, as we do say for necrophilia, which, again, did not know what it meant till now. I think that a very little relevance to moral judgment. We attack this vice not because it is the worst, but because it is, by adult standards, the most disreputable and unmentionable and happens also to be a crime in English law. The world will lead you only to hell, but sodomy may lead you to jail and create a scandal and lose you your job. The world, to do it justice, seldom does that. And after 30 years, Jack gave me the word... <laughs> the worldly justice in that one moment. You can take a moment. I had been freed. I had been freed through his validation from someone that I knew got it to the level that I've screamed for someone to understand on earth. And I had written in the margin, <laughs> he gets me like no one else can. <laughs> With a heart. <clears throat> and finally, <clears throat> just because I think it speaks to him and how how much, like, this thought never left his mind, what happened to him. It changed him for sure, and he was at peace with it. But I found it interesting when I found the letters to Narnia book that he had written on March 24th, 1962, just one year before his death. So very old. <clears throat> Dear Francine, I was at three schools all boarding schools, of which two were very horrid. I never hated anything so much, not even the front-line trenches in World War I. Indeed, the story is far too horrid to tell anyone of your age. So glad you like the Narnian books. With all good wishes, yours sincerely, C.S. Lewis. And I was very proud of the editors for including that. Yeah. So. Yeah, we we are actually going to be doing Surprise by Joy, not next season, not the season after that, but the season after uh, that, because the Wade Center is bringing out an annotated edition, mm. which will explain lots of the obscure references, at least they're certainly obscure to someone living today, and particularly if you weren't born and raised in England. Sure. So we're waiting until then to do Surprise by Joy because I don't want to do as much work as I would have to do. <laughs> well, it is truly a beautiful, beautiful book. And um, you're going to be disappointed, but I didn't finish it. After no, that no, point. Not at all. Like I said, I abandoned it the just first Just because time. after I got to that point, the rabbit trail kept going. And so um, I will get <laughs> back to, for the third time, Surprise by Joy. But I'm happy that they're going to be addressing it because I just found it very reflective of, um, of him. So I'll never probably read his adult and books. <laughs> so... For... Oh, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> for me, it's fun. And, to... and we will actually be doing. For, we will actually be doing his letters to children next season. Which I'm. We're gonna have 
at least two episodes. So excited it. about! <laughs> truly, truly amazing. So yeah, so that that is the inner ring um, kind of topic that I had. Uh, so, did you have any questions, or should I keep moving on? No, nope, let's keep moving. On. Okay, perfect. So <clears throat> part of my resources were taken from your podcast because you had so many. I thought, again, cliff notes, this might be <laughs> be an easy way to brush up on some topics while I work or do other things listening to some of your shows. And so I had come across from 21, a show you did with the Grey Havens, <clears throat> mm. and it caught my attention because um, right before my conversion, the Grey Havens became very impactful for me. I wasn't listening to Christian music, uh, but I was listening to Spotify and one day Pale Moonlight had popped up. And <clears throat> even though it was Christian, I don't know, I just, it was so haunting, the lyrics. And um, they were so, they spoke to me because I had felt that I was sold this lie and I was so angry with Satan because I had lost my entire life in the sense that I won't have the chance to get remarried and have kids the right way. I'm 43. That ship has sailed. My illnesses just made me not be the best wife and best mother and best daughter and sister. And the anger I have with Satan for just believe, making me believe I didn't have any self-worth is so extreme. And so that song literally just felt like it could have been written to, for me. And so I kept listening to their music almost in a way that it just... I was working out like Far Kingdom it was a song of theirs that really for me put me in heaven reconciling and coming back to God. And now I was back. I had like this peaceful place. I don't know. Their lyrics are amazing. And through their words and my imagination, I was able to have so many conversations with God. I thought there was something so special about them. I even had my Catholic friend try to investigate because I didn't understand what was going on. I'm like, I don't care why I'm reacting to this, their music this way. Um, I knew nothing about them and I wasn't a listener of Christian music. So, but I got a lot of healing from that. So I listened to this podcast you did with them. Ironically, at the same time I was listening to them um, two years ago, and they talked about this album. And then I learned it was based on C.S. Lewis and some of his works, which I did not know at the time. <laughs> and, yeah. <laughs> and so I discovered the silver chair through... Through listening to your podcast, and then um, I listened, I listened to David Radford's too, um, and so I discovered the Silver Chair, and I listened to the Silver Chair podcast you did because I hadn't read the Narnia books, but uh, it sounded it had contained a bullying story, and I thought, well, gosh, that sounds like something that I, you know, would maybe be interesting to me, and. <laughs> Another kind of like revelation for me was when Kristen, Deacon, Deacon Lazo's wife, he, he she was had Deacon said, then. now he's father. Oh, fa oh, he's a father. Oh, God bless. Good for him. Oh, well, he had said, um, I don't know if I'm understanding right, but he, she had said that. God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. It's going to be great. It's going to be awesome. But no one talks about the hardship and trial, which is part of that plan for your wonderful life. 
And that had really resonated with me because I have always felt really ill-equipped to deal with life as a child. I was so in heaven and so with God, not having really any family um, and believing in the good and that the world was good and people were good, that as I started to grow, I was terrified because bad things were happening to me and bad things were happening around me. And um, I didn't understand the difference between heaven and earth um, and that the things here weren't going to be like the things were in heaven as a kid. And so, um, I don't know, I just really loved that statement that she had. So, um, so then to the blue flower, <laughs> now that I was aware what the blue flower was listening, um, I just couldn't believe that it was literally like a few sentences from the paragraph that made me put down, like David had said that he wrote, the votary had struck him. And so uh, it helped inspire him in writing this album. And I thought that was so weird that a few sentences before that, I was inspired to learn more about Jack and this candle light. And so I wanted to know more about this blue flower because <laughs> surely there must be meaning in it. <laughs> so, mm. so I found an article that was really good uh, called Votaries, the Blue Flower in Navalis, McDonald, Lewis, and Robinson that was written, and I don't know if she was a student, but by a Hannah Hubin last fall. And she described the blue flower and actually quoted the story that Navalis had written that um, where the blue flower is mentioned and that, um, you know, was a mystical symbol for longing. And so then I was reading the book Owen Barfield on C.S. Lewis to see if I could get any more material for today. And at the very end of the book, I was floored when he's having, Owen is having this conversation with Clifford Monks, who was an editor of the journal Towards. And he discusses the importance of um, kind of Nivalis and the blue flower and, um, the origination. So if it's okay, I'm just going to say from that real quick. Um, mm -hmm. Just because I, I just, I think it's so, it just describes so much. So monks had asked Owen, I wonder if in your recollections, you could collect one from your many meetings with Lewis when something occurred, which has been indelibly impressed upon you. And Owen said, yes, possibly the one I remember best is that of sitting with Lewis in his garden a few weeks after I came back from Germany. I went there in the first half of 1929, learned German, and was much influenced by German Romanticism, especially the work of Novalis. Owen continues to say that Lewis put the point of view that it was unworthy to want things badly, that the only way out really was to identify yourself with the universe, and I remember I rapped out without thinking, nonsense, a man must have his Zen suit. I don't know if I pronounced that right. I also remember his quoting this later in a way that revealed it had sunk in. I took the point of view that, yes, you ought to be trying to identify yourself with the macrocosm, but that your yearning and wanting things badly was really part of your being. Monks replies, so that was an occasion when you were a considerable influence on Lewis, and Owen says yes. Monks asks, if you go back to what is of so much interest to people, the Inklings, you also, in the early stages of your career, wrote The Silver Trumpet. And of course, Tolkien has a tremendous following for his Lord of the Rings cycle. <clears throat> All of this we call imaginative literature. Can we think for a moment about the distinction between your imagination and Lewis's? And I love Owen's response. He goes, The Silver Trumpet was written before the Inklings came into being. But in answer to your question, <laughs> did you read the lecture? <laughs> Did you read the lecture that I gave at Wheaton College called Lewis, Truth, and Imagination? And Monk says, no, you spoke about it there, this difference in your imaginations. And Owen says, yes, in detail. Monks asks him, can you tell us something about it now? And Owen answers, I said that if someone put a pistol to my head and asked me what was Lewis's relationship to imagination and gave me 60 seconds to answer him, I would have to say that he was in love with it, and he was. He liked it so much and valued it so much as an experience of the human soul that he did not want its purity tampered with in any way. If you tried to say it had anything to do with truth, 
the discovery of truth, then it would not be imagination. That's what the Great War is about. Whether imagination is a vehicle for truth or whether it is simply a highly desirable and pleasurable experience of the human soul. He had the very strong feeling that you couldn't relate it in any way to truth without destroying its imagination, <clears throat> destroying its essence as imagination. He was in love with it. And Monk says, but wouldn't that love be somewhat similar <clears throat> to being in the presence of it or under the influence, influence of it? And Owen says, yes, he was in romantic love with it. Monk, sensing an apprehension, replies, but, and Owen says, but I wanted to marry it. <clears throat> <laughs> so I wanted to understand, shock, <laughs> why he was married to it <laughs> and who Navalis was <clears throat> because I just didn't think he could be ignored. Like, Navalis had the blue flower. The blue flower, like, was in Surprise by Joy. There was the album. It cited Navalis' hymns to the night at the very end of the OS, you know, C.S. Lewis and, or Owen and C.S. Lewis book. And so I wanted a hard, hard copy of the poems and of Navalis's poems. So I ordered a book entitled Rampoli, or Rimp I'm not sure you pronounce it. Um, but it was written by- Rampoli. Jo okay, uh, thank you. Written by George MacDonald. And I didn't know at the time that George MacDonald's was Lewis's master. So I get this book with Novalis' poems that had been translated by George MacDonald. And, um, and I found it interesting to learn that MacDonald had spent more time on Novalis and his translations of the spiritual songs and hymns than on anything else he's written. And I read The Golden Key by George MacDonald. It was a fairy tale he wrote and um, he even credited credited Navalis in the end of the chapter. He's writing about like the child and like these geometrical figures. And like in the middle of the paragraph, he says, I think I should credit Navalis for the geometrical symbols or something. And like my mouth dropped and like, and he just continues with the story. <laughs> it was like a random thought of how like crediting Navalis. And so I just thought, Novalis and McDonald clearly are important people. It just it just couldn't be a coincidence. So <clears throat> moving on to the Great War, at this point, I felt I had understood Jack's role in my life. But Owen had appeared with Jack, and I hadn't figured out his part yet. <clears throat> so I decided to start with your podcast on Owen because I hadn't been able to comprehend his books. <laughs> and so the... Oh, gosh. It's like if he, I can't, I'm long, I go on tangents, so I guess I shouldn't, I can't criticize his writing. I write the same way. <laughs> but, um, but I envy Jack's conciseness, just like Owen does. Um, so I listened to the podcast that you did with Owen's grandson, also Owen Barfield. And, um, he was so amazing, and I love the passion he had for his grandfather. And towards the end of the podcast, he was describing a scene where his grandfather, they were packing a studio, and he recalls Owen sitting in a chair saying, it'll be 50 years before my work is understood. And my heart sank in that moment. <laughs> At first, because I felt bad for Owen, thinking maybe he didn't get the time and the recognition that he deserved. But then I thought maybe he meant it as an indication that civilization was going in the wrong direction and that it would be 50 years uh, before his effects might have, or his work might have any effect. And he was sad knowing it would be that long. I don't know. But either way, I was on fire to try and understand Owen after hearing his grandson speak. So I picked up Poetic Diction for the third time. <laughs> and I, I felt like by the end of the second chapter, things maybe started to click. And I thought, well, this could be what I've been doing. I've been working to improve myself through my intuition and inspiration and imagination and um, the same 
sequence that resulted in the candle line and uh, the lyrics I was doing through the songs. And um, so I ordered an anthroposophy book and it came and I'm like, this isn't at all what I had in mind. This is like, I sent it back. <laughs> I just didn't get it. So, uh, but I thought about it and I had learned about the Lectio Divina um, on my journey uh, Catholicism journey. And I thought, well, that kind of sounds like more of my vibe or what I've been doing. Um, so it wasn't scientifically based. Um, I was opening myself up to receiving the Holy Spirit. And, um, I think that Owen maybe felt the same way, uh, just kind of my thought. I listened to the podcast that you did with Dr. Mark Vernon and Dr. Michael Vincent DeFuccio. And I had to listen to his twice. I wrote lots of big words. <laughs> um, <laughs> but they were they were fabulous on expanding some of those mystical theories. So then I wanted to know why Owen was married to romantic imagination, because he obviously felt real strong to make that definition between his and Lewis's mind. So I ordered the silver trumpet for more money than I ever thought I would spend on a book. <laughs> um, but I was so inspired after Owen. I felt like if I'm going to peddle these candles, I have to have the first book by the first inkling. So um, I was reading it and there was an afterword by Marjorie Lamp Mead who was the associate curator of the Marion Wade collection and someone I think I'd really like. And she, in this afterward, she had said, but as Barfield was exposed to the theology of the incarnation, he found his perception of Jesus slowly expanding. Poetry and the beauty of oratorio such as Messiah also contributed to Barfield's increasing consciousness until at last he found himself a convinced Christian. And this signified to me a very monumental moment for Owen's life because German romanticism and imagination not only played a huge part in his Christianity, but I, when I looked up Messiah and Handel, Han, Handel was from 1685. So it was just kind of this ancestry of Handel to, you know, Goethe to Novalis, Coolridge. And it really showed this ancestry of Owen's love with imagination and German romanticism. So I did see that he was married to it. Um, and I felt at peace with that. Um, when my husband and I moved to the cities this spring, we joined uh, St. Michael's Parish um, in St. Michael, Minnesota, uh, and they were offering a course titled Healing the Whole Person. Um, which is based on someone called Dr. Bob Shooks or Shucks. I'm not sure how you pronounce it, but their mission is to promote and inspire transformation in the heart of the church by healing and equipping God's people for the new evangelism. And it was a very informative program. Um, I was a Catholic, obviously when the Pope was around, but he sounds just amazing. Um, and I benefited so much from that program. And when I was reading to understand Owen, the Barfield romanticism come of age, I had gotten to this one point, which kind of put it all together for me, for um, Owen's thoughts. And he had said, perhaps it's all rather wild speculation, but I suppose one should keep one's mind open to possibilities. But the more people I talk to, and there aren't very, very many of them nowadays, they seem to feel that something's got to happen fairly soon. Something rather fundamental and spectacular, catastrophic possibly in the near future. And the more that comes through on the news, the more convincing this seems to me to be. This development of bombing in Japan there had just been a bomb explosion in the Tokyo underground. 
and what they call militias in America, together with the development of new explosives that are very easy to make, easy to transplant, and use. If someone can make lethal explosives in a test tube and is not especially concerned to protect his own life, you can't do anything about it. Is that going to be a kind of axe laid to the root of Western civilization? I don't know. I'm rather glad I'm not a young man, that's all. And he was a young man of the Great War. <laughs> so again, these are very impactful comparisons. I'm worried about our children, what kind of life they've got to go through. When one raised that kind of issue in the past, the answer sometimes was that children would be born with the forces to deal with it. But how can they? I don't know. And I was just thinking about the importance of healing and what I was finding in this program. And a few years after he had given this interview is when Columbine happened. And what I kind of noticed is that he was right when the 21st century happened. It felt like me, like everything just fell apart in the world. And it was just tragedy after tragedy after tragedy. And so I just knew I used my imagination through teachings that I had been taught these last couple of years to find God's truth in, you know, um, Sarah Sparks, singer-songwriter, who also did the Narnia C.S. Lewis lyrics, um, and then the Grey Havens. And I don't know. I just think that Owen's thoughts are fruitful, and he's not very concise <laughs> about relaying them. Um, but I just, I don't know. I feel like you. Um, I guess that there's just a lot there. And in the Great War, um, you know, I think Jack, concerned with idolatry, was just so happy to be Christian again and have God back in his life. He didn't want to risk that at all. And and Owen, being more like me, who's very emotional <laughs> um, and very feeling, maybe wanted to help him deepen it a little more. But imaginations I've learned process differently. Mine's very different from my husband's. My husband would never have gotten those lyrics, you know, what I got from the Narnia lyrics. <laughs> so um, neither is right or wrong. And they knew that. That's why their war was great. And I just, I, I don't know. I think their friendship is truly beautiful. So, yeah. Hmm. In closing, I just wanted to say that I started this conversion process because of a vow I made to God, but I continued it because once I understood what Catholicism was and not what I thought it was, I fell in love with it, and it's opened me up to a whole new world of knowledge, grace, divine mercy, healing, and I loved when Charles Williams' father said, he had taught Charles that there are many different sides to an argument and that it was necessary to understand the elements of reason and the other point of view as well as your own. Above all, he insisted on accuracy, impressing on his son that one should never defend one's opinions by exaggeration or distortion of the facts. And I am almost two years into my conversion process, and I have been painfully yet gracefully burned clean. <laughs> Well, I'm I'm excited. You have you have so much wonderful literature that you're going to get to read for the first time. Thank you. I, I'm particularly looking forward to you reading the Four Loves because okay, Lewis devotes an entire chapter to friendship, and uh, I I think I think that'll give you some insight into what Lewis saw in his friends and what he loved so much about them. I will do that. Well, Michelle, thank you so much for coming on the show. As the landlord rings the bell for final drinks, can you tell us where people can go to find out more about you and Inkling Candles? Yes, you can go to my website, inklingcandles.com, and I'm also um, on Facebook and Instagram at Inkling Candles. Wonderful. Well, thanks again to Michelle Hogan for coming on the show. And if you've enjoyed this episode, please share this episode on social media, and maybe tonight, light a candle and say a prayer. And please join us next time when we'll continue going further up and further in. Cheers.